Hello, my name is Yuli Restrepo. I'm a professor of instruction in the English department. And today I'm going to be reading a short story I wrote uh, titled Pablo Escobar, which was recently published in the Tampa Bay Noir anthology. Um, uh, before I start reading, I would like to thank Leslie Vega and the McDonald Kells Library. Uh, and thank you all for being here and for watching this video. Okay, so here it goes. Pablo Escobar. On the Tuesday of my second week of 11th grade in America, Nicole found me eating on the stairs by the soda machine and introduced herself. Several weeks later, I'd be clinging to the back of her sweater as we said goodbye for the last time before she got on a plane to somewhere in Oklahoma. But that Tuesday, I was just scared to talk to her. The school floor plan dictated that at lunch, students had to gather in a big rectangular space in the middle of the building, and there were few places where I could eat without being out for everyone to see me. The previous week, my cousin and her friends, who were in the 10th grade, had made fun of my ratty, faded Chuck Taylors and middle part, and the fact that I was wearing jeans instead of a skirt, and my general fob -ness. After that, I stopped sitting with them at lunch. I wanted to talk to no one, especially some girl who couldn't speak Spanish. Nicole put a lot of coins in the soda machine and pushed some buttons and took out two plastic bottles with what looked like blue liquid in them. She walked over to the stairs where I was failing to take delicate bites out of what the cafeteria sign said was a sloppy joe sandwich. Nicole handed me one of the bottles. The liquid inside was indeed electric blue, and the label said Fruitopia. You're in my French class, she said. I don't think you've seen me because I sit in the back. You're always in the front. <clears throat> Nicole was short and chubby, with brown hair that she had styled in stiff curls and small incandescent blue eyes. Even as my heart raced with the responsibility of answering, I thought of my mom, who would have loved the color of Nicole's eyes, as she had been loving the blue eyes of people we encountered in the overly air-conditioned grocery stores of Largo since we'd moved to America a few weeks earlier. Nicole was wearing cargo pants, a tight navy t-shirt, and crisp white sneakers that she later told me were K-Swiss, as if that was supposed to mean something to me. She'd soon be my first real American friend, and I'd lose her just as quickly. Thank you, I said. We're in French together? Yeah, I sit in the back. Might as well because I never know the answers to the questions. You know all the answers, but I can never hear you when you say them. I know a little French, I said. Before leaving Colombia, I had been in college for a semester, studying foreign languages. My French was good, but English was what I liked to study the most. Now it made me feel dumb when Americans spoke to me and I couldn't keep up, or I pronounced a word I knew well in a way they couldn't understand, so silence became my refuge. Nicole opened her soda and drank three big gulps, pointing with her eyes at my bottle, asking me to do the same. The soda tasted like cotton candy. I thanked her again. Where are you from? She asked. When I told her, she said she didn't know where Colombia was, but that some cousins on her mom's side were from the Virgin Islands. South America, I said. She nodded. Outside, a blindingly bright and hot late August day raged but any natural light that entered the building did so through a row of, of small windows high on the walls above student lockers. The spotless white floor, the blue lockers, the cafeteria tables, all had the sheen of fluorescent lighting. Did you know there was a shooting at this school a long time ago? Someone shot in here? Yeah, my dad told me two kids brought guns to school and started shooting people at lunch. I think the principal died or something, but it was a long time ago. Anyway, they were fucking crazy. I kept trying in vain to eat daintily while Nicole told me tales of the place where I had come to live. 
She told me about the rainbow stain in the shape of the Virgin Mary that had surfaced on an office building window in Clearwater, about a town full of psychics and mediums, about alligators in people's swimming pools, and ghosts in an old hotel that was now a university building in Tampa. She said her dad was a huge nerd and liked to collect all kinds of things, including these bizarre Florida happenings. She said we could eat together from now on and that I could go over to her house whenever I wanted. That night, my mom and I dragged a beige leatherette sofa we had found in the curb of our street into our duplex. It was the only piece of furniture we now had aside from a TV dinner table my mom's boss had given her. The previous night, the aunt we had come to stay with had yelled at my mom for not doing anything around the house and we'd had to leave and move into the apartment we had found only a few days earlier. We had planned to move into it after we got some furniture. My aunt didn't work and spent all day watching tennis matches on TV and sipping vodka out of an iced tea can and crying while showing me clothes she had worn when she was young and thin. I didn't know what to do with all that, so I pretended I had something else I needed to do. I didn't even have the guts to tell her she was being unfair to my mom, who worked two jobs. Eventually, I understood this was what made being friends with Nicole so easy. She expected nothing of me but what I could give her. She didn't even expect me to talk. The morning I met Nicole before I'd left for school, my mom had given me a piece of paper with the address of the apartment we were moving into. It was one street over from my aunt's place, a street full of duplexes just like ours, whitewashed with overgrown front yards and chain link fences and old cars parked outside. Ours was a 1975 Chrysler Cordova a co-worker had sold to my dad for $500. It had no air conditioning. I told my mom about the virgin on the window and she said we could go see her when my dad felt better. I also told her about Nicole. She said she felt happy I had made a friend and that it was good that she spoke English and not Spanish because my English would improve. We dragged the sofa into the living room. Then I laid a sheet over it and claimed it as my bed for the night. My mom had already put out some thick blankets and bed covers on the carpet of the master bedroom for my father, and that's where she'd sleep too. The three of us drank iced tea and ate a pizza my mom had bought at the grocery store and heated up in the oven. The pizza was topped with tiny spicy meatballs, which I hated, but the iced tea was sweet and cold. After dinner, I finished what was left of my homework and lay on the couch ready to sleep. The neighborhood felt wholly quiet in a way I wasn't used to. At night, my neighborhood in Medellin was full of the sounds of passing cars and neighbors' conversations and music, and even after people had gone to sleep, the steady whistle of the night watchman. Now all I heard was the hum of the air conditioner and the fridge which made the apartment feel emptier. In the middle of the night, I went back to the bedroom to ask my parents if I could spend the night on the floor with them instead. The couch, it turned out, was riddled with ants. My dad's accident happened three days before my aunt kicked us out and four days before I met Nicole. Only a couple of days after arriving in the States, he got a job at a recycling plant. He hadn't even had time to visit the beautiful Clearwater Beach my aunt kept telling us about before he went to work. The day of the accident, one of the plant's conveyor belts stopped working and my dad, who had been a mechanic back home, offered to take a look at it. He climbed onto the belt, which was about two stories high, and removed stuff that had gotten it stuck, at which point one of his co-workers, who didn't realize my dad was up there, turned on the belt and my dad fell into the machine at the end of it. His whole body went through the grinder before anyone could help him. He broke no bones, 
but he bruised some ribs, and when my aunt brought him home from the ER, he looked like someone in one of the many stories that I'd heard back home of people being given scopolamine and taken to various ATMs around the city until their bank accounts were empty and they didn't know who or where they were. His dark hair was gray with debris and his eyes were bloodshot and his shredded work pants ba barely covered his scraped up legs. Upon seeing him, a flood of heat and tears rose in me and he said, don't worry, things can only get better now. I'd never seen him so frail. Even on the day his brother was murdered on a street corner for helping as a messenger for one of Medellin's branches of the Liberal Party, at a time when being open about any kind of politics made you someone's deathly enemy, my dad had been sturdy, sturdy as he grieved. Now the sight of him told me the opposite of what his mouth said, and that's what I should have listened to. If I had, I could have protected myself at least, but now it was me in high school after having attended college, my mom working two housekeeping jobs that kept her away from home from six in the morning until 10 at night, and my dad trying to heal his bruised bones even as he slept on the floor. We shared an empty duplex and we had no one but each other, or at least I thought so. My parents wanted me to think otherwise. How do you think we got this car? My mom said. And who helped us get this apartment? We were sitting on the carpet sharing another pizza. This one had only vegetables in it, and I liked it much more than the one before. Well, it wasn't our family, I said. Don't say that, my dad chimed in. If it weren't for your aunt, we wouldn't be here. Yes, but that's money you still owe, I said. And how are you going to pay her now? A few days after we moved into the new place, Nicole asked if I wanted to go to her house after school. And when I said I couldn't because I had to go take care of my dad, she asked what was wrong. As best I could, I told her about my dad's accident and our empty apartment, about how we didn't have pots and pans for our kitchen and how all our money had gone to, into paying a deposit and first month's rent for the duplex. I'll come visit. I promise I won't stay long. I'll get out of your way if your dad isn't feeling well. That afternoon, she showed up at the duplex with two men. One was overweight, dark-haired, and pink-skinned, the other tall, lean, and blonde. They both wore baggy jean shorts and black shirts, though the big man's shirt had bright yellow and orange flames all around the bottom. Nicole's hair was in a high ponytail, and she wore olive green shorts, a red crop top, crop top with spaghetti straps, and huge gold hoop earrings. This is my dad, she said, pointing at neither of them. I told him about you guys and he wanted to help. God knows we have enough fucking stuff. Hi, I'm Jake, the tall, thin one said, shaking my hand. This is my friend Corey. We brought you a mattress and some other things. The mattress is good, I promise. Okay, thank you, I said. We all walked to the driveway where a small silver trailer was hitched to a giant black pickup truck. Nicole's dad opened the trailer to reveal a mattress on which my parents would surely be able to sleep, and an array of chairs, tables, kitchen things, and even a 20-inch TV. All that is for us? I asked. We have an air mattress in there too, Nicole's dad said. Nicole's going to inflate it for you. Listen, you have to tell your dad about workers' comp. He should have some money coming, do you understand? My cheeks, already warm from the summer heat, grew warmer with tears. I nodded and thanked him. I could, car I could hardly speak from sobbing. Now, girl, Nicole's dad said, let's not turn this into some sappy moment. I know that whenever Nicole needs you, you're going to be there for her. This is purely selfish, okay?
like everything else he does, Nicole said, and gave him a taunting grimace. He didn't react, instead stepping into the trailer to push the mattress out. I thought that was so strange. I could count on one hand the number of times my parents had hit me, but saying something like that to them would have surely added to the count. And here was such a nice man doing kind things for us at her behest, and this was how she treated him. I stopped crying, mostly from feeling like I should beha behave extra obediently to make up for Nicole's brattiness. I decided to please Jake, to be as invisible as I could while they brought stuff inside. I let myself feel his kindness and the warmth of hopefulness. In less than an hour, Jake and Corey had taken everything inside and dumped the Aunt Riddle sofa back on the curb. I went to get some iced tea, only to find them sitting on it when I got back. The thick August air made my hair stick to the back of my neck and my clothes feel heavy as if, as if I'd been swimming in them. The men's faces dripped with sweat and they drank in big gulps and talked about other people they knew. Even though they looked so different, they seemed like the same person. They modeled each other the way the children do the, their schoolmates. They both seemed good humored. They wore the same clothes and moved in the same jumpy, bird-like way. Both had patchy beards and wore chains that linked their wallets to their belt loops, but neither wore a belt. After they drank the tea, Jake took out a pack of Newports, gave one to Corey, and put one in his mouth. I could tell it was the same for everything else. They liked the same music, the same food and drink, the same women. Nicole stood by the chain link fence that separated our duplex from the one next to us, kicking the grass with her pristine sneakers and sending the gray sand that had been resting among, among the brown blades up in the air. This was how all the yards on our block looked, spotty, brown, equal parts grass and sand from the soft Florida soil. Why are you here and not there? I asked Nicole. They don't want me there. They keep whispering shit to each other, so I might as well not fucking interrupt them. They're probably talking about my mom anyway. God, he's such an asshole. Your mom? All they do is fight, and then they do shit like this. Throw parties, volunteer at school, give away stuff. She hasn't even slept in their bedroom for months. She calls him an idiot for all the nerdy, creepy shit he's always been into that she knew about from the beginning. So he brings Corey over, and they stay up all night listening to music and watching their weird-ass movies at top volume and smoking weed. He yells at her for not letting him enjoy his life. They're both assholes. Don't they care when you call them that? She shrugged. My mom's threatening to move back to Oklahoma where my grandma lives. Anyway, if you ever want some weed, I can steal some of his. Nicole's dad got up and crushed his cigarette stub while Corey threw the iced tea cans in the garbage and shook off the ants that had managed to crawl up his legs. They both laughed softly at something one of them had said. I couldn't imagine Jake yelling at anyone, much less his wife. Does your mom work on Saturday? Nicole's dad asked. No, sir, I said. If she's going to take care of your dad, I'll take you and Nicole to the beach. If you let me drive, you wouldn't have to take us anywhere, Nicole said. You're not going to drive this huge ass truck, honey, he said. Can you even reach the pedals? Corey said and laughed until he was out of breath. I didn't know whether his face was flushed from the heat or the laughing. God, you two are such fucking dicks, Nicole said, then climbed into the truck and slammed the door. Indian Rocks Beach was one of the hottest places I'd ever been. There was nowhere to hide from the light here. Even in the late afternoon, the air smelled of sulfuric heat just as it had on the day we landed in Miami after our flight from home. 
on that day as we drove up that lonely four hour stretch of highway to Largo to the apartment we'd be kicked out of a month later, I could see waves of heat rising up from the pavement. Before Jake brought me and Nicole to this beach, I had only been to Clearwater Beach once when my aunt had brought me and my mom to eat ice cream by the pier. Mine was promptly stolen by a seagull. That had been when my mom didn't have any job at all, and we still pretended my aunt didn't have a drinking problem. We played the game of getting along while I slept till noon every day and told myself repeatedly I liked this quietude, hoping the day would come when I'd believe it. Now, Nicole, her dad, and I sat on towels on top of sand, coarsened by millions upon millions of shells, and I wondered why the only people in the water were parents with their young children. Otherwise, we were surrounded by a few older people, often sitting in pairs on beach chairs and reading magazines or thick paperback novels. Nicole's dad said all of them lived in the condos that lined the shore behind us, their pastel facades a rainbow. Most of them only come in the colder months, so a lot of those apartments are empty now, he said. It gets pretty cold up north, but some of them moved down here for good. I'd like to own one of these myself when I get older. I wondered how anyone could afford these beachfront properties in the first place, let alone a second winter homes. I couldn't understand how I was here now, surrounded by luxuries at scene and movies, when only a few months ago our neighbors had pulled money so we could pay our power bill, so my mother could cook dinner, and I didn't have to do my homework by candlelight. It was hard to understand how these places were within reach now, but I still had to wonder whether we'd make rain rent next month. I don't think I'll ever live in one of them, I said, pointing behind me. Sure you will, Jake said. Anyone that comes to this country gets the same chance. The air smelled like the older people who moved here wanted to be burned alive. Nicole had slathered on an oily lotion that smelled of coconut. She lay on her back with a towel covering her face, not saying much. Jake asked me a few questions about my family, like where in Colombia we were from, and why we'd come to the States, and how we'd end up in Largo. There was so much I could have told him about those candlelit nights that came after the men who'd killed my uncle, starting directing their threats my dad's way, so his usual clients wouldn't do business with him anymore for fear of ending up like my uncle. I could have talked about the block parties the neighbors threw at Christmas time, about getting up at four in the morning to take the bus to the metro so I could be on campus in time for my six o'clock English class, and how sometimes I didn't have the money for the fare and couldn't go. There was so much I wanted to tell him, so much that got stuck somewhere between my brain and my tongue, so I just said the things I knew how to say. Oh, Medellin, Jake said. Pablo Escobar, right? I smiled and nodded, holding in a sigh. He took a sip of his light beer and readjusted his black baseball hat. His brown eyes glinted in the inescapable sunlight. His face was covered in weed-colored, scraggly hairs that didn't do much to protect him from the sun. I hadn't seen him put on any sunscreen. I've read all about that guy, he said. He was a bad guy, I said. Oh, no doubt, but I've read all these articles online about all the money he stashed in all these places that people still haven't found. I mean, it's been like six years since he died and no one has found it. That's awesome. But that shootout where he died was crazy, right? He slapped his thigh. The photo of all those soldiers posing with his corpse on that rooftop? That's hardcore. I'm pretty sure I have it somewhere at home if you want to take a look at it. I'd seen the picture, of course, and I didn't feel I ever needed to again, but I nodded. I knew he meant well. He was just trying to connect with me in a way his daughter didn't feel the need to. I remembered my mom's tearful gratitude 
upon coming home and finding the apartment full of things that made it look like a place where real people lived, and the note she had me write for Nicole's dad in my best English. He'd been kind to me, and it felt easy to be nice to him. That's how I found myself at Nicole's house that evening, standing in the room where her dad kept all his memorabilia. As Jake went through drawers and piles of paper, Nicole plopped down on a reclining chair in front of the TV. Her skin still glistened with the stuff she'd put on at the beach, and her cheeks and the bridge of her round nose had turned pink as cotton candy. She was still wearing sunglasses, even though no natural light entered the room through the black curtains on the window. The walls were covered in posters from what he explained were cult horror movies, movies with titles like Blood and Lace and Brain Damage and Kill Baby Kill. There were also posters for movies I did know, like Fight Club and Pulp Fiction, and framed newspaper clippings of bizarre stories of living dolls and people being swallowed by sinkholes. Enormous speakers accompanied the enormous TV, and in a corner stood a small desk strewn with papers and action figures and guitar picks and DVD cases. The word that came to me while standing in the middle of the room was as Jake frantically looked for the Pablo photograph was Reblujo, which is what my mom called the small room where we used to keep junk back in Medellin. Here, even the carpet served as a resting place for guitars and exercise weights and junk food packages and soda cans. Can you hurry the fuck up, Nicole said. I want to get this gunk off of me before dinner. I swear I have that photo in here somewhere. Your mom must have hid it. Why would she do that? She doesn't set foot in this pigsty. You see how clean the rest of the house is, don't you, Vicky? That's because mom cleans it. I said nothing, but it was true. The rest of the house was spotless. It was all beige walls and pictures of palm trees and ocean sunsets and shiny glass surfaces and spotless white tile. The living room had a beige sofa, but I could tell it was real leather and not an ant in sight. You know what? Fuck it, Jake said, throwing papers on the carpet and pointing a slender slender finger at me. You stay for dinner. Call your mom. Change into some of Nicole's clothes. I'll drive you home later. I'll look for the photo in the meantime. We left him rummaging through the junk in his room, huffing and throwing things on the carpet. Nicole's mom found me and her daughter on the beach sofa, going through the family album. It contained picture after picture of a small, chubby Nicole holding kittens and blowing out the candles of her birthday cakes and standing next to Mickey Mouse. My parents had only brought a handful of family photos with them of my grandparents and uncles and aunts, as well as one picture of their wedding and one of my first communion. Nicole's mom, who introduced herself as Carmen, appeared in a few pictures in their album, wearing shoulder pads and hairspray, her lips fuchsia, just like my mom looked when I was a child. Now, as she sat across from us, she wore green scrubs and black chunky shoes, and her dark hair was up in a high curly bun. Nicole was her spitting image down to the only dimple that formed on the right side of her face when she smiled. As Carmen examined me, her shoulders slackened and a white grin filled her cheeks. Nicole had lent me a pair of denim shorts that didn't quite hug my hips and a large white t-shirt with the word NASCAR in big block letters. You girls having a sleepover? Carmen asked. Her voice sounded salty to me like the roar of the waves on the sea. Oh no, I said. No, just dinner. We ordered pizza, Nicole said. Jake's on one of his rants about a stupid photo. He just really needs her to see it. Oh, it's okay, I said. I know, Nicole said. We know, Carmen said. Don't worry, honey. We'll eat dinner and I'll drive you straight home. Sorry he's holding you hostage. Did you call your parents? I nodded. 
I didn't understand the word hostage, but I memorized the sound of it so I could look it up in my dictionary at home. Carmen got up slowly and sighed while undoing her hair tie. The curls flopped down in one clump. She dug around in her purse and left a bill on the coffee table. I'm going to get changed before dinner, she said. You be on the lookout for the pizza. What followed was an hour-long screaming match behind the closed door of Jake's memorabilia room, during which the sausage pizza Nicole had ordered got colder and colder. I couldn't hear most of what they said after Nicole turned on the TV to a music video channel that people called to request their favorite video. I could hear pointed accusations like, what is wrong with you? But most of it was muffled or drowned out by the volume of the television and Nicole calling the number that scrolled at the bottom of the screen to request, you make me sick by pink over and over using what she proudly announced was her dad's credit card number. Even though I couldn't hear most of the row, it reminded me of the last few months at home when my parents argued over money they didn't have for bills they couldn't pay. When Nicole's parents came out, Carmen was still wearing the scrubs and her hair was still tangled, but now her cheeks were flushed and her blue eyes glinted with a giddiness I hadn't seen before. Jake looked as collected as ever, and during our cold pizza and orange soda dinner, didn't mention a single word about the Pablo photograph. When he apologized for making me come over, I stopped bracing myself for another fight. Both were now in full couple mode, asking questions about my dad's health and my mom's two jobs, and because I didn't know the word housekeeping yet, I mentioned the things my mom cleaned instead. Floors, windows, toilets. My mom didn't work her second job on Saturday and Sunday afternoons, so one late October Saturday, we went to see the Virgin on the window. My mom's boss had written directions on a piece of paper, and I read them to her from the passenger seat of the Cordoba, while my dad's long legs cramped in the back. My parents wanted to go pay a promise they'd made to the Virgin of Chiquinquira on, on behalf of our safe passage and transition to a new country. They still hoped to make it back to Medellin to pay the promise for real, but now that my dad could move around more or less normally again, this would do. I would never tell my parents this because their response would have been that God manifests in many forms, but I found the shrine unimpressive. The building where the Virgin had appeared was by the side of a highway, unceremoniously next to a Toyota de dealership. The image of the Virgin itself looked like an oil slick that had spread over a couple of large mirrored window panes of what we were told used to be an office building. It was an outline of what could be the Virgin, but also almost anything else or nothing at all. In front of the window, someone had installed a life-size wooden cruci crucifixion, in front of which was a church kneeler. Before the statue were countless votive candles and rosaries. People stood around or sat in white plastic chairs and prayed in the choking heat of fall. A man who introduced himself as Guadalupe told us the image had appeared four years earlier, just before Christmas, and that was why so many people believed it was a miracle. He was short and wore brown slacks and a navy button up and he said he came to pray every Saturday. On seeing the slickness of his forehead, which he wiped with a white handkerchief, I wondered if he dressed the same way every time he came, he came to spend a scorching afternoon with the Virgin. He offered my dad a chair close to the Jesus statue after my dad told him the story of his work accident. I should be dead, my dad said. When that machine was grinding me, I felt like my organs were just going to burst out of my body. All I could think was that it brought my family all the way here just to ab abandon them. But here you are, standing after all of that, Guadalupe said. Yes, and I can walk and move. It hurts, but I can do it. 
That's a miracle, my mom said. They sat together and prayed a rosary while I stayed silent, wondering what would have happened to my mom and me if my dad had died. Would we have stayed alone in a new country where we were afraid to answer the phone for fear the caller would speak only English? Would we have gone back home and begged one of our relatives to take us in while we figured out what the rest of our lives would become without him? And what would our lives become now? When we opened the door to our apartment, it was evening and the phone was ringing, but we didn't answer it. It rang and rang until I got a look from my mom that, that had started to become familiar in this new life, which begged me to speak on their behalf to whoever they couldn't understand and couldn't understand them. I recognized Nicole's voice through the receiver, but not what she said. She was yelling rapidly, and the words sounded like they were reaching me from the other side of an ocean. What happened? I asked a couple of times, but it was useless. She yelled and cried, and the only word I understood was help. We drove to her house. The car still smelled of the remnants of our McDonald's dinner, which we had shared with Guadalupe. My parents didn't like the food, but it was cheap, and the air conditioning inside offered relief from the heat. I loved it and had gleefully eaten my, eaten my oily apple pie on the ride home. Now the smell made my stomach turn when I thought of Nicole's ragged voice. I wasn't even sure I could point my mom to her house without getting lost. When we arrived at her street, the car got flooded with waves of blue and red light. We parked by the corner where police cruisers and vans didn't obstruct the way, but as I ran toward her house, my parents yelling after me, cops standing around chatting to each other and looking at their watches and lazily shooing away the small crowd that was starting to gather behind the yellow tape that cordoned off Nicole's house, I felt as if I were the only one with any sense of urgency. That was until I saw Nicole, and she saw me and started running to me, her face a mask made of garish red and blue light, yelling, he killed her, he killed her, he killed her. And in that moment, I remembered that earlier at McDonald's, we'd seen an, a very old man making his slow way to the counter with the aid of a walker, and that having picked up his food, he couldn't maneuver his way, his way to a table and that my dad had said to me to go give him a hand, and having felt shy, I'd said no, so he'd gotten up himself and helped the old man on his own slow way. I thought of this as Nicole extended her arms to me, and I understood she had no one else, and that was why she'd called me, and she didn't have to tell me the whole story for me to now understand what she had said on the phone, which was that her dad had killed her mom and now she was all alone. I understood that when Jake had said that I'd be there for Nicole someday, that his help to us had been purely selfish, he'd meant it not in the way of self-deprecation, but in the way of a payback he expected me to give someday. Well, that day had come, and as the steam of Nicole's breath gathered on the skin of my neck when I took her in my embrace, I knew it was time to pay back the things America had given us. Okay, that's the end of the story. Thank you so much for listening.